well. So I've uh, been in this spot many times, um, either at the beginning or the end or the beginning <laughs> or the open beginning or the end. And you might have expected that I indeed have run out of vision. <laughs> so I was really pleased, and I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me and giving me only 15 minutes and having my talk being preceded by such brilliant um, visionary uh, remarks. Um, and also putting my talk at the end upon special request so that uh, if I go over 15 minutes, I can <laughs> deal with John. So I'm, I decided that, uh, you know, uh, after these brilliant talks, there was really little I could add. And uh, uh, I'm sure you're still all thinking of that, those 80 questions. And I can't wait to look at them. And it was a very nice idea. But um, so I decided to limit myself to a few remarks. I, and uh, I noticed you also didn't have anyone to summarize the conference, although Michael Green did a very good job, so I don't have to do that either. I presume you didn't summarize the conference because of the parallel sessions and, and innovation. Uh, but you know, a conference like this, uh, full of, every talk was fantastic. Some of them I didn't understand, I admit. Uh, and some of them truly resonated. Those are the ones which sometime in the far past I'd worked on. And uh, so, for example, these, un these beautiful equations, uh, which are now called the scattering equations, uh, uh, which were discussed here, with these unbelievable magic formulas of Freddy that Freddie showed us. Um, there's work on, uh, presumably, which will give us great insight into uh, higher spin symmetries, which is the reason that I first got acquainted with those scattering equations, or determine the saddle points of perturbative strings and the tensionless limit. But now, with the higher spin system uh, symmetries, maybe one can start answering the question that was just uh, discussed by Andy. What are the underlying symmetries of string theory, whatever string theory is? There was also this talk I found especially beautiful related to matrix theory and instantons that Marino gave, which might teach us something about M theory. Um, this same beautiful talk by Steiberger on the Superstring amplitudes, and and uh, finally this talk on uh, the emergence of space-time, Einstein in dynamical space-time from entanglement. So those are five of my favorites, but truly all the talks were magnificent. But um, you know the the conference as a whole, as usual, was spectacular, extremely well organized beautifully put together in the style that only Princeton can do. <laughs> but uh, the first session was very unusual. And we've probably all forgotten that by now, but I was a bit struck. And I decided I would say something about the scientific method. <laughs> <laughs> now, we had a wonderful debate and discussion of BICEP, which we all were, have been very excited about and its potential uh, for informing us about, about the inflation, about cosmology, and maybe uh, physics at, close to the Planck scale or the cut scale. Um, but I was struck with the remarks of Paul, who gave an impassioned uh, speech warning us that bicep uh, probably didn't observe uh, B modes. But he made the following statement about inflation. 
He said, the inflationary paradigm is so flexible that no test or combination of tests could disprove it. I find that a very strange statement to be making to this audience <laughs> of string theorists. Because after all, if you simply replace inflation <laughs> by string theory, um, you get a statement that many people make, out of this room, of course, but often. And uh, <coughs> so I, w I thought it was incumbent on a string theorist to defend uh, the kind of speculative theoretical physics that we all do, and uh, that Andy described in such emotional terms that it almost brought me to tears. <laughs> And I, I would like to recommend to you a uh, marvelous book that has came out last year by a philosopher of science who actually knows quite a bit of physics called Richard Dawid, called String Theory and the Scientific Method. A book that has been endorsed by both our chair and by myself uh, for asking the question, uh, how does string theory, the behavior of this community, uh, fit into the model that philosophers or sociologists, historians of science have about how scientists do science and the scientific method that they apply? Now, we all know the issues because we have critics outside of this room who complain that string theory is, uh, <coughs> is unscientific, is divorced from empirical tests, and therefore not the way science proceeds or should proceed. Um, and we all sort of know in our bones why they're all wrong. And, um, but Dawid was in a very interesting book, uh, tries to understand that and put that uh, explain to other people who don't know string theory, or not part of the community, uh, but um, why it is that, what it is that we actually believe, why do we continue to believe in string theory even though it hasn't had any demonstrable experimental verification of the type that, say, Paul was demanding of the scientific method, making a you know, specific testable prediction, setting up the null hypothesis, doing the measurement observation, confronting the prediction with the uh, measurement, and uh, disproving the theory. Now, of course, part of the reason come to at the end is we don't really have a theory. We have a framework. But more specifically, Dawid points out three things that we all know, but he does it quite uh, carefully and in a way which I think we would all benefit from learning about so that we can, among the rest, defend ourselves against the Philistines. So one is what he calls UEA, Unexpected Explanatory Coherence. This is one of the reasons we all have faith and confidence, growing confidence, in what we call string theory. It is this is something that is common in physics. When a physical idea, a new phenomena, a new speculation, a new theory produces unexpected, unanticipated consequences that are important, solve some other problem for which the idea wasn't, it gives you increased confidence in that concept. For me, that occurred early on in my career discovery of asymptotic freedom, which was an explanation of the short distance behavior of the constituents of hadrons, also had a flip side, infrared slavery, that explained, uh, or could explain, was a qualita qualitative explanation of the confinement of those point by constituents. That wasn't what one was searching for, but this um, concept 
produce that. And string theory, of course, over the years, the decades, the 46 years of its existence, has been full of such unexpected planetary coherence. One of the strongest reasons we're attracted to this framework. Dual resonance model, which led to string theory, which led to gravity, led to supersymmetry, unification, black hole entropy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of those are ex profound examples of unexpected explanatory coherence. Second uh, thing he points out that is the source of our faith in string theory is uh, the NAA, no alternative argument. Now that is a very strong principle, guiding principle for scientists in any field, but it's increasingly powerful in fundamental physics. It was already true in large part in the standard model. There really is no alternative argument for, uh, which is for many aspects of the standard model, once they were firmly tested and, and uh, formulated, which is why we have all had faith for 50 years that the Higgs particle, as predicted, would show up as it did. And after almost 50 years of string theory, again, most of us are convinced that we're addressing some of these issues. Uh, there simply are no alternative arguments. And the third uh, principle that Dawid points out, again we understand, is what he calls MIA, meta-inductive argument, which we don't formulate as often, but it is absolutely true. It is the success, often empirical, you know, of other theories which are part of the same research program. So string theory is not you know, off on its own. It is, we believe, and most of us started out, a continuation of particle theory, of elementary particle physics. <laughs> and one of the reasons we have such faith in the string theory framework is its deep connection to its origin and to the standard model, and, um, which has been incredibly well confirmed in the standard scientific method. Empirical uh, tests of precise quantitative predictions using the null hypothesis. And of course, we all await the next, <laughs> the next strong evidence uh, for the meta-inductive argument with the discovery of supersymmetry, which will happen in the next few years at the LHC. <laughs> now, of course, so this, I think, if you think about it, are roughly a rather nice formulation of the reasons that this community has faith in this activity, which for many lay people, or people outside, in other fields of physics, even, uh, feel is dangerous and unscientific. And so this book is, I recommend to you. Now, of course, we do have problems. This is, it's much nicer not to, not to be in the meta stage, but the realistic stage. Where the main issue, of course, being one that uh, Planck understood, just a little over 100 years ago with the discovery of the Planck constant and this incredible difference of the scale of unification, string theory, um, maybe inflation at this incredibly high energy short distance scale, which we can't access uh, directly by, by any means. And that can, of course, lead us to feel, aside from the, this great feeling of camaraderie and exploration and beauty that 
Andy described so well, to a feeling of depression and anxiety because, you know, we're still working down here and with many clues to try to turn this theory into a real theory, which could make quantitative predictions. So for all of those of you who get depressed uh, over anything that's happening, happens in time, I'd like to end with giving you my theory of history. And it's based on the phenomena that, you know, the old joke, somebody asks you, oh, how are you doing? Not bad, worse than yesterday, but better than tomorrow. <laughs> now, a lot of people feel that way, in fact, you know, every, people are only really aware of the first derivative, and things seem to always be getting worse. And so I once tried to figure out how, how is it things are always getting worse, budgets are always getting da going down, the politics is always getting worse, everything's always getting worse. And yet, over the long run, if you look back 100 years, 200 years, <laughs> things get better. So, of course, we, we got to graph that. <laughs> and so the things are, you know, locally, things are always going downhill. But yet, over the long run, things get better, right? Um, so mathematically, this is what kind of function uh, is monotonically decreasing. First derivative is, always, is negative almost everywhere, and yet increases. Of course, it's, what happens is that every once in a while, <laughs> something really good happens, like the election in 2008, uh, the invention of the, of the personal computer. You know, the good things happen, and they happen Sometimes bad things happen rapidly as well. Those one has to be concerned about. But over the long run, things get better. <laughs> so that's my theory of history, and that's why I'm optimistic. And they're coming to a conference like this, there are many reasons to be optimistic, of course, because these conferences are always a yearly proof that string theory is alive and healthy. And the two most important criteria, as always, are that there are many new and brilliant string theorists that we have heard from over the last five days, and that these conferences themselves continue to flourish. These conferences, which are sort of a bootstrap phenomena, they're not supported by any, any particular institution, and and people continue to run them with great enthusiasm and professionalism and a lot of effort, as this one was. So, and we look forward to the coming ones. And I just want to put in a word for India. You know, we're going to be next year in Bangalore at a new Institute of Theoretical Sciences, uh, which Spenta is leading. And that will be very exciting. And the following year, the conference is going to return to China, where it had a spectacular conference uh, almost a decade ago at Tsinghua University in Beijing. And this is a site of something else very exciting that will be happening in the future. This is where the Great Collider will be built. And then, Israel, for the first time, oops. What happened? Israel, for the first time, Japan, and Okinawa. Uh, maybe Belgium. <laughs> no, 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 I have nothing against Belgium, I'm just not sure. That, that, I didn't want to make uh, Mark upset by making that definite, but they have plans. And then maybe in the 
second decade of the 21st century might return to America. <laughs> there are some American universities that should do this. <laughs> <laughs> and haven't yet, and I can think of MIT, Harvard, combination, Stanford, Chicago. So the future seems very, very bright, and uh, this conference was certainly an indication of that. Thank you.